Travis Scott has made some of the most popular, yet also the most creative music of the last 10 years. He's known for hugely successful songs and unique album experiences like no other artist. But at this point in time, he's been all but gone from the music industry for five years, with questionable material the few times he has showed up since 2018. So is Travis Scott an all-time great artist with an iconic style, or is he a sellout who gave up his creativity for money and fame? Is he a musical visionary or a marketer who just happens to make songs? This this is the insane true story of Travis Scott. Travis Scott's sound has been unique from the very, very beginning. Back in 2012, at the age of 20, he was working on Kanye's legendary Yeezus and Cruel Summer projects before he had even dropped his own debut mixtape. And by the time he did drop his first mixtape, he had production help and features from some really important artists who already saw his vision. Because Travis Scott risked it all for his dream of being an artist. Travis Scott grew up his whole childhood in Houston, a massive, sprawling city in Texas that he later described as being full of hungry, grimy, weird people. He said that being around such a strange and dark environment as a child gave him the hunger and edge to feel like he needed to get the hell out and find his own path in life. So it makes sense that at the age of 19, Travis had enough and dropped out of college in his second year. This video is sponsored by my streaming service, Nebula, where you can watch my brand new exclusive original Danger Music right now. In Danger Music, I explore the dark side of live music with some truly insane stories about the most wild, violent music ever made in a way that could never be published on YouTube. So go check it out and watch Danger Music right after this video. During an old interview with Complex from 2012, he said that he lied to his parents. He told them he needed money for books and a laptop, and he spent all of it on a plane ticket to New York to meet with people and make music. But New York didn't work out, so he flew to LA instead, and he only survived by still lying to his parents and asking for more money for school while he was actually working on music and sleeping on people's couches in LA. And that's how Travis got his first big break in the industry. At the same time as his parents found out he was lying to them and ended up cutting him off from the family financially, he was working on music every single day, making beats, developing his skills as a rapper as quickly as he possibly could. His parents eventually showed up to the dorm room that he was supposedly staying at, only to find out he wasn't there and that he was actually in California the whole time. They ended up cutting off his phone and his bank account, leaving him completely stranded out in California. But his only goal at this point was to make music, no matter who told him it was a bad idea. He already hated being in school, later saying that it was killing him to be sitting in class, knowing that he could make it as a rapper if he tried. So why not just try to chase his goals? It wasn't like he had anything to lose. And this first song, Lights, which was quickly noticed by T.I. and Kanye, it isn't a bad song at all. It does feel like a kind of funny mix between old Kanye and Kid Cudi, Travis's two biggest influences to this day, but it's not an amateurish song. Travis's voice sounds great, the beat is catchy. My mama always asks me about my attitude. Damn, mama, I don't know it all. I met this chick who wanna meet me up the avenue. But even better, this song ended up being the start of Travis's career. It was noticed by T.I., who would later sign Travis to Grand Hustle. But even more impactful than that, just when Travis was at his lowest, staying at a hotel paid for by an A&R, not knowing where to go, having practically no money to his name, he got a call from an engineer who was working with Kanye, and he told him that Kanye wanted to meet him. So Travis went back to New York, he met Kanye, he played him his music, and that's where Travis Scott's career really began. After getting noticed for Lights, this song that he made with no audience, no fans, no clout in the industry, it was good enough that he was invited to work on Cruel Summer and Yeezus. He contributed production to multiple songs on those projects, developing the distorted industrial sound that he's continued to build on ever since. And don't forget, all of this is before he ever dropped his first mixtape. At this point in time, Travis barely had a few songs released to the public, but it was clear that the potential was there for him to make some great stuff, and the right people had already started to notice. But when he did drop his first mixtape, after tons of delays and a complete rework by Kanye and Mike Dean, giving it the executive producer treatment, Owl Pharaoh immediately became a modern classic. It's a strange, raw, loud, abrasive, dark mixtape. In all, it's honestly not that good. Like, it's a pretty early amateur mature, rough-sounding version of better music he would make later, but it's still one of the best mixtapes I've personally ever heard. It has so much personality and character in the music, and a certain strangeness that Travis would give up later as he became a more experienced public artist in the future. But songs like Hell of a Night, Quintana, Upper Echelon, Uptown, they're some of the best of their time. They're early 2010s trap music, but there's a unique aesthetic that belonged specifically to Travis. 
Straight from Mexico, call her Quintana. Damn, she smoked my door. Swear to God, we go Rambo. His early music is dark. It's weird. It's kind of sparse, distorted, even creepy. In a lot of ways, I think he had some pretty visionary ideas early in his career. No matter how rough or raw Travis's early mixtapes were, because they were pretty rough, the ideas on these projects are pretty clearly ready to be developed into legendary pieces of music. And Owl Faro, relatively, was a huge hit. It was interesting enough that Travis pretty much became one of the most promising new artists overnight. Around this time, he was dropping lots of music. Upper Echelon with its bizarre, creepy, southern weird don't play with Big Sean in the 1975. Travis was bringing a lot of new ideas to the trap genre in a way that made his songs still sound good to this very day. Listening back now, songs like Uptown, Meadow Creek, Hell of a Night, they still hold up because they were different. You can definitely hear how much he was inspired by Kanye and his team in sequencing these mixtapes, making the sounds, melodies, vocal distortion, but at the same time, you can also hear how Travis's ideas did contribute to the overall sound of Kanye's work at this time as well. Cruel Summer, Yeezus, even The Life of Pablo, I don't think those albums would sound the way they do without Travis having been around Kanye. So his potential was crystal clear, and that's how he got into the rooms he was in with those musical legends early on in the first place. They could just tell. Travis Scott, even in the first few years of his career, he knew how to make his music sound like it was his. Days Before Rodeo was Travis's next mixtape, and it's even more so the same kind of project as Owl Faro. It's not a perfect album by any means, but it's so full of ideas and potential that to this day, some people consider it one of their very favorites. And you know what? I'm one of them. I love Days Before Rodeo. It doesn't matter how unpolished it is. It doesn't matter that the mixing is terrible, that there's no good quality versions out there to download. It's just so packed with different sounds to a point where the end result is strong enough to stand on its own as a unique piece of music. Days Before Rodeo is heavy, dark, and menacing. Almost all of the production ideas, the vocal effects, the flows that Travis would later turn into massively mainstream signature ideas, they're present on this mixtape in an extremely pure form. From the cultish, beastly energy on zombies, all right, I watch her take too many martinis. She slips straight out bikini. She let me grant. Or the slow, eerie guitar riff that introduces the thumping beat behind Mama Sita. This is the last days to the rodeo. Last night had me down in the back, comatose. Don't think sunshades and a pill gon' help. Quintana has some amazing rapping. The production is intense as can possibly be. Drugs You Should Try It as an indie rock, heartbroken ballad. Skyfall features an insane Young Thug verse, an early Metro Boomin beat that fully foreshadows the sounds that would later come to dominate the music industry as these handful of artists grew up. Young Thug's flow on Skyfall is perfect. It's still one of my favorite songs he's ever made. Even the song Grey, which is this kind of goofy little bouncy song that sounds like Trap meets Jack Johnson, it has genuinely interesting production. Keep that in mind. Fit two things being broken done. Yeah. Jump your ass inside. LSD, come take this ride. 90% of the songs on Days Before Rodeo still sound good to this day, and it's one of the best mixtapes I've ever heard. It is literally the definition of a cult classic. And while it's relatively obscure, the people who do know about it recognize it as one of the best projects Travis Scott made. Because even though Days Before Rodeo feels a little unfinished, the raw energy from a young artist trying to prove himself more than makes up for that. And that's why I just can't tell the story of Travis Scott without talking about how good Days Before Rodeo really is. Even though it's not on Spotify, even though the majority of Travis fans have never listened to it, it's just as creative and artistic as all of the vastly more popular albums that would later come after it. It's not as cohesive or clean as Rodeo, but from the experimental ideas in the production, like the chanting on zombies to the delicate organs on the prayer, it's a dramatic and immersive project to say the least. And for some people, maybe myself included, it might be Travis Scott's best work. But while Days Before Rodeo really set Travis up as being that guy who could be next up, 
that guy who wasn't just making good music, but was making fun music at the same time, Days Before Rodeo didn't make Travis a star, at least not yet, because he still didn't really have a project out, just singles. Owl Faro, Days Before Rodeo, they are both free mixtapes that couldn't be sold due to the fact that there were so many uncleared samples throughout the projects. So back then, Travis really only had singles out in the world, on Spotify, on Apple Music, on YouTube, Upper Echelon, Mamacita, you know, those were great singles, but they weren't all that popular, they didn't actually chart, and with under 100,000 followers on Instagram at the time, playing venues with a capacity of maybe four or 500 people, Travis Scott was still underground, but he was on the way towards blowing up thanks to all the work he did for Kanye, thanks to all the musical legends that were ready to co-sign him, thanks to being on the XXL freshman list, but he wasn't mainstream yet, and definitely not. So when Travis dropped Rodeo, that's what really put him on the path to being a major star. But even more than that, Rodeo is a type of album that doesn't even really exist anymore. I'm ready to argue all day that it's genuinely a modern classic, that it's standing the test of time in a way that very few other albums do, but why? First of all, it's perfectly sequenced, and it genuinely feels like so much more than just a collection of songs like so many albums today. There is a vision behind Rodeo, a common thread of motif, the album is driven by ideas in its content and its sound. So in my mind, Rodeo is one of the best albums of the 2010s. Personally, it's one of my favorite albums ever. For me, Rodeo represents everything that an album should be as an art form. Thanks to the way that Travis and his producers and collaborators combined interesting sounds with mass appeal, vocals and lyrics that are unique and substantially experimental while having a mass appeal at the same time. And because of that, Rodeo created a new standard for what trap music could be. About the album itself though, it was clear from the earliest moments of Travis's career that he was kind of a visionary. Even his early work like Owl Faro, Days Before Rodeo, it's not good because it's shiny and polished, it's good because it feels like listening to a creative breakthrough. It's not a still life painting with perfect proportions and colors and shapes, it's a raw expressionistic picture of a raging bull with crooked lines, angry colors, and unexpected figures. Energy and shock value pushes art forward. That's what Travis was doing in his early career. Career, and Rodeo is the absolute peak of that idea. This album just starts going and it doesn't stop. The concept of Rodeo itself comes from the idea that Travis felt his life pursuing success in music had become a struggle. He said this during an interview, it's like a Beyonce concert, the carnival, the livestock, the show, it's all a part of the event. I feel that's how my life is. The carnival is like my imagination. It's the drive behind my vision. And this theme of Travis's life being a rodeo appears as a common thread throughout the album from beginning to end. And somehow Travis's first album managed to be a chaotic musical rodeo full of unstoppable energy, complex song structures in a project that overall feels like a beautifully cinematic, sonically diverse musical journey, beginning with the intro track pornography that sets the stage for Travis's career as a superstar with lyrics that perfectly describe his mission. As T narrates the album's introduction, it serves as a kind of introduction overall for Travis as a rapper, describing his mission as an artist. In the middle of their metamorphosis, not quite through with their journey, ain't made it to wherever the fuck they gonna be in life, but wherever it is, it's better than here. So fuck you. And, fuck and it's followed by just one of the best sequences of songs I've ever heard to this day. Oh My This Side is a two-part track that starts as a cold, dark, melancholic banger, with Travis singing about his experiences trying to make it in the music industry and everything he sacrificed to get to this point. The beat switch introduces some funky keys and becomes a much happier instrumental with these little washes of synth and soulful melodies, with Travis and Quavo rapping about the life they left behind back in their hometowns of Houston and Atlanta. Lines like, Mama kicked me out the house now, I might end up on a couch now, I'm on a flight now, LA, add another couch now, it directly references the stories that Travis tells about being 20 or 21 years old and trying to find his big break in music back in the day. Mama kick me out the house now. Oh my, I'm lying down on the couch now. Oh my, I'm on a flight now. Oh my, LA had another third song, 3500, it's an almost eight minute track featuring Future and 2 Chains with the title referencing the absurdity of Kim Kardashian buying her daughter a $3,500 coat at the age of two. Being produced by Travis, Metro Boomin, Sunny Digital, and Mike Dean, the beat for 3500 features multiple movements full of layered synth melodies, forlorn strings, deep bass, and a gorgeous outro that lasts for over a minute. Ladies hold up the champagne, a whole lot of it. Pain killers, they got back pain, or you gotta love it. Things out of NYD in my hallways, I got a lobby of them. Only true niggas I know. 
up and down with Chase Monday nights. Wasted with Juicy J is a filthy southern rap track where Travis pushes his voice to new heights of distortion while Juicy J lays out a demented flow and T.I. ends the song with a spoken word verse about Travis as the hero with an uncertain fate in the dark world they're creating with the music. Drowning in this shit, coppers on my hip, I hold my head. I've been taking risks to make that money flip, I stood it. I ain't ordered it, I can't afford this shit. Go to war with this, you overboard, I'm overboard with shit. The next song, though, is one of the most legendary songs Travis Scott ever made. 90210 is the bohemian rhapsody of the 2010s. It's a long song, almost six minutes, but there are multiple beautiful sections that take us on a cinematic journey through his new lifestyle as a rap star living in Beverly Hills, painting the ups and downs of his new life with equally vivid colors. From the storyline about a girl Travis knows who will do anything for a taste of fame and money, to the point where it's just as depressing as it is fun, to the way that he sings about his pursuit of fame tearing him away from his family before the success brought them back together. It's a song that relies heavily on contrast and juxtaposition. Yeah. My granny called, she said, Travi, you work too hard. I'm worried you forget about me. I'm falling in and out of cause don't worry, I'ma get it, granny. In the last verse, he raps gold chains, gold rings, I got an island on me, houses on me, he got them ounces on him, referring to both the value of his jewelry being worth a house, but also to the fact that becoming rich added so much more responsibility on his shoulders. From the beautiful feature from Casey Hill, to the guitar solo, to the dreamy faraway piano chords, to one of my favorite lyrics ever, as Travis sings, my granny called, she said, Travi, you work too hard, I'm worried you'll forget about me. It's a beautiful story about the weight and the dark side of chasing success and the price that has to be paid for becoming the hero of your own story. And it's just a perfect track from Travis's humming to the sample of a sample taken from Kanye's family business. For a lot of Travis Scott fans, myself included, this is his greatest musical achievement. It's the type of song that could only be made by an artist with something to prove to the world. Someone searching for their purpose and someone on the verge of achieving everything they've ever wanted. Maybe it isn't Travis's most popular song, but it's definitely one of the realest pieces of music he's ever made. It's Travis's own story written in a way where many people can apply their own experiences to it. And that's why it's been so timeless and it's still loved to this day, eight years later. But even beyond 90210, there are many other amazing moments on Rodeo that make it the cinematic masterpiece it really is. Pray for Love features The weekend. It has a mind-blowing sense of progression and structure. Pray for love, love stay fate, and die too young. Pray for the ones I hate, the ones I love. Pray for my liver when I'm off in this club. I pray that the demons go away, they haunt in us. Man, I can't take no Nightcrawler is again a bombastic sprawling banger with an explosive verse from Chief Keith. Piss on Your Grave is one of the only songs where Travis and Kanye rap together despite working together for over 10 years. Piss in your grave, piss in your grave, this one here for the executives, fuck you and all of your relatives. Piss in your grave, piss in your grave, piss in your grave, piss in your grave. Antidote was Travis Scott's first big hit. Impossible is a meditative, dark, moody song that follows closely in the footsteps of Drugs You Should Try It from Days Before Rodeo. It's one of my favorite songs in the series of dark, thoughtful, emotional songs that despite straying far away from the turned up, demented rage music Travis always makes, he still includes on almost every project. Ride with me, yeah, you wish you could now. Always come and go and never fail. It was never love, I could tell now. She pop him up just to get it up. Pop it feels heavily inspired by, of course, Kanye's work on 808s and Heartbreak, except Impossible is somehow even more stripped back than that already minimalistic pop music was, with a beat that would be almost ambient without drums. Maria, I'm Drunk is a masterpiece of a song that features Young Thug and Justin Bieber. Flying High has one of my favorite progressions of any song on Rodeo, despite being the least streamed song on the project. Toro y Moi added not just vocals, but entire breakdown in his vivid, melodic indie style. Of course, Rodeo ends with a bang, with some of my favorite instrumentals, lyrics, and melodies actually coming in the last four songs. Never Catch Me has one of my favorite Travis beats. OK, I'll Write is a dreamy, floaty masterpiece, but Apple Pie is a perfect outro for the album. Travis kind of comes full circle on the album's storyline and finishes the process of growing up that he's been experiencing, becoming a rock star, changing his family's perception of him, of course, with a price. After 
two verses about leaving his family behind to find his destiny and create his legacy and build a life of his own, leaving behind the safety of everything he knew, T.I. gives this spoken word outro where he says, tours and shows and groupie whores wouldn't hesitate if he had to shoot, though he'd rather not, yet instill the question that arises to the mind, will he make it? Was it worth it? Did he win? Will he survive? the rodeo. And that's more or less exactly what rodeo is all about. Throughout the record, Travis encounters these different terrible things. Drugs, women, all these horrible influences that aren't good for him. Things that can distract him from his goals and steal his future, but he embraces it because he's on this journey to fame and transforming himself from a kid in Houston to an internationally known rap star. From pornography to 90210 to apple pie, he's on this journey dodging evil, trying to escape with his soul still in one piece as he chases fame and fortune. And I think that's why Rodeo has lasted so long and become a cult classic album, because in a lot of ways it is unintentionally, or maybe intentionally, loosely following one of the most timeless story structures ever. From the ancient Greek Odyssey, to Star Wars, to Lord of the Rings, to Good Kid Mad City, some of the most famous stories of all time can be called a hero's journey. It's a type of story structure or template for a narrative where a hero goes on an adventure. They encounter different kinds of tests and trials, they meet enemies and allies, and eventually you reach a point in the story where the hero is an entirely different person from when they started. That's the story of Rodeo, and that is the story of Travis Scott himself. But at the same time, I think the main reason why Rodeo has lasted so long is the complexity of the song structures. Almost every track has build-ups, crashing resolutions, hard-hitting drops, elaborate intros, beat switches, bridges. The sense of theatrics, the wide-angle, panoramic skill that Travis cultivated on Rodeo, it's not all that surprising that this album is considered a pioneering piece of music. It's one of the best albums that was ever made in the trap genre, and it still sounds new to this day. Because Rodeo is more than just a trap album. It's more than just a pop rap album. Thanks to the story the album tells with its production, its layout, and its lyrics and vocals, I think it's going to last much longer than anything else Travis or his peers were making at this time. Not long after Rodeo, Travis announced a new album, Astral World, naming it after a legendary closed down abandoned theme park in his hometown Houston, but it would be more than three years until that album came to life, and in the meantime, he had a few more projects to put out first. So Travis's next actual full length album after Rodeo dropped less than a year later, and I personally consider Birds in the Trap Sing McKnight a double edged sword. It's not Rodeo. It's really not rodeo, but I don't think that's what it was supposed to be. I think it's easy to forget that looking back seven years later, it's actually the album that made Travis Scott a household name, and it was technically way more successful than rodeo in terms of sales and streams. But I'm gonna be straight up with you guys, I just don't think it's as good of an album. Even though it did major numbers and it made Travis an A-list rapper, it's just not the same experience. So what is the deal with this strange, maybe underrated, maybe overrated middle album that Travis would later say wasn't even meant to be a sequel to Rodeo, but was instead just something he had to get out of the way before Astro World. First of all, the Birds intro track is just insane. This is one of the best songs Travis ever put together. Hands down, it's one of my favorite songs he ever made. From the moment the deep, melodic bass rumbles through the speakers to Travis's rough singing setting the tone for a dark and emotional album, all the way to Andre 3000's verse about the highly disturbing yet true story of the 30 children and young adults who were murdered by Wayne Williams in the late 70s and the early 80s, many of the victims being the same age as Andre 3000 at the time, it's an extremely unique song with a minimal beat that really relies on the excellent performances of Travis and Andre to set the tone for the darkness of birds. Ain't making friends, we just making hobbies. No, that one, my girl, that was just a hobby. Call up 50, tell them load up the lobby. Elevator up, no need to fob me. Yeah, yeah. X-ray vision see through you niggas. And there are a lot of other great songs and great sounds on Bird throughout the project. Honestly, it's full of great tracks. You can see why most of these songs have hundreds of millions of plays on Spotify, or even more. From the fluid, non-stop song structure that goes from beat to beat to beat on Way Back as Travis rides a groovy flow. I need fake niggas to get way back. James on with the range, oh me nigga way back. Homie stars switching lanes, I thought we went way back. I can get no rest. The haunting sound of coordinate that starts with keys and drums feeling like a dreamy bird's eye view of Travis's relationship with drugs that was only becoming an even stronger part of his music as he became a bigger and bigger artist. Keep the big and make a little more dick. If any fuck nigga get out of line, and any fuck nigga wanna do something, nigga, we can do it. Nigga. 
rock star skinny. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna need some more, need some more. The dreamy ethereal sounds of STP interlude. The new me back with the OU. The dog always find his way back home, and it's so true. Later on, fall through and pop one. The monstrously intimidating beat and flow on outside. For me, them boys make you do a backflip. Balance on the beat. Yeah, balance on the beat. Yeah. Do some shit I never seen. Won't you come out with the team? Yeah. Yeah, you might just rent a ring. Yeah. Why they home on they home screens? The insanely popular songs like Goosebumps, Pick Up the Phone. I get those goosebumps every time yeah. you come around, yeah. You ease my mind, you make everything feel fine. Worry about those calls. I'm waiting on ya. Yeah. The weekend's beautiful feature on the outro track, Wonderful. Oh my, what a wonderful time. Been a minute since I pulled up outside. Shut it down, yeah, we do that eight times. Ooh, we got a feeling you might get. Yeah. Birds in the Trap has some amazing moments. The production throughout this record feels intense and dark, but beautiful at the same time, with flashes of melodic beauty popping up like light in the dark through the muddy, bassy, nocturnal, low-end, powerful instrumentals. Sluggish bass lines combined with sparkling keyboards, the album's soundscapes are intentionally all over the place, and the vibes really are nocturnal and drugged out. Songs like Sweet Sweet, Outside, and Guidance feature instrumentals that are dark and deep. I will up behind it, I wanna try it. Cup on your ways, bust up the place, tantalize it. You from the islands, you stay violent. I got, I got you. Like with a sense of catchiness still shining through, which really did reflect the album's loosely overarching themes discussing Travis's drug-fueled rock star life that was affecting him for the better and worse at the same time. It was also a theme that he depicted in the Birds in the Trap short film that begins with a scene where Travis's girl just up and leaves him without him even really seeming to care due to his ego and pride, only to end up paying the ultimate price for his arrogance, dying and coming back to life as a robot. And with these kind of dark hedonistic songs combined with the hauntingly beautiful, deeply layered production, Birds has a very unique, cohesive sound that stands alone in Travis's discography. He hadn't made something like this before, and he didn't really make something like this after. But on the other level, above the songs and sounds, it was a downgrade from Rodeo. The epic feeling of Rodeo being a true rags-to-riches story for Travis with some personal songwriting, excellent lyrics, and deeper themes, that's a big downgrade on Birds. The lyrics are mid at best, and on some songs, they're just straight up bad. Even Travis's vocal mixing doesn't really help. Sometimes the distortion and the auto-tune drenched in reverb sounds atmospheric, other times it's easy to lose exactly what's going on or why. Too much of a good thing. A lot of the edge that Travis came with on Rodeo, songs like 90210 or Piss on Your Grave or Maria I'm Drunk, that quality, those memorable stories, it's not really present here. The lyrics are pretty whatever, and it's just not an album experience like Rodeo was, and those are some of the main reasons why I became a Travis fan in the first place, because the guy really knows how to make an album. But Birds did end up being a really successful project anyway. It was Travis's first number one album on the charts, and it truly turned him into a rap star, with songs like Goosebumps going eight times platinum. And overall, Birds in the Trap is a quality record. Even though it's not an impeccably crafted concept album like Rodeo, it caught the rising wave of the trap sound in mainstream music, and it made Travis one of the biggest names in a genre that was quickly becoming the biggest genre around. And ultimately, I think if Travis had made another Rodeo instead of something safe and full of easy hits like Birds to grow his audience, he might not be the star he is today. He might never have had the opportunity to make the other albums that he did later on. But again, after an album that just was pretty good, Travis had been teasing this Astro World project for forever. He was saying that it was going to drop in 2016 at first, then he did Birds, then in 2017 it was supposed to come out again, but he ended up dropping a different project, Huncho Jack with Quavo. And even though I'm a big fan of Travis, I'm not going to pretend that Huncho Jack was anything special. That being said, there are definitely some amazing beats on Huncho Jack, from motorcycle patches to modern slavery to moon rock to Dubai shit. Who the ghost? Different place, different chips, ATL. 
And Huntro Jack is a pretty good trap album thanks to that cohesive sound and production, even if there's nothing really special about it that makes it still hold up as interesting to this day. It's definitely worth listening to if you never have before, but it might not be something you want to listen to twice. Even before Travis's generation of artists hit it big in 2016 or 2017, bringing the trap sound into the mainstream, as far back as 2012 or 2013, songs like Jewels and Drugs from Lady Gaga's Art Pop, Dark Horse by Katy Perry, Flawless by Beyonce, these were giant pop tracks that had a trap style, and they were some of the first times that trap music reached the mainstream pop landscape. So by the time that artists like Travis Scott, Young Thug, Metro Boomin, when they came along, they were in a position to elevate trap beyond its southern roots and turn it into a force of commercialism and artistry that would last for a long time. Trap songs like Trap Queen, Panda, Black Beatles, Bad and Bougie, Bodak Yellow, This Is America, these were extremely dominant on the charts and in social media around the time that Birds in the Trap and Astroworld dropped. And even bigger pop songs like Seven Rings and Thank You Next from Ariana Grande, Havana by Camila Cabello, Old Town Road, the late 2010s were dominated by the sound of trap music. And Travis Scott was was quickly becoming not only one of the most popular artists of that moment, but someone whose work would define the whole genre, some of the most critically acclaimed work of that scene. And in a way, he would go on to last many, many years longer than the genre itself. But Astroworld was finally released in August of 2018 after two years of rumors, delays, side projects, Lucy's, and so the hype was massive. Astroworld had become this idea, this hypothetical giant. Singles like Watch and Butterfly Effect were extremely successful. He was featuring on massive other songs like Dark Knight Dummo, Love Galore, ZZ, Portland. And so the idea of Astroworld itself had come to have so much weight to it. An album full of Travis's soul, represented by the memory of a defunct theme park in Houston, Texas. You could feel the spirit of this record before it was even out. The way that Rodeo told the hero's journey, the way that Rodeo came together to form a story with memorable themes and motifs, Astro World was supposed to be everything that album was, but even bigger. The album experience was supposed to be exciting and meaningfully interesting at the same time. If the hype could be believed, Astro World was going to be the big one, but not just the biggest, also the best. In music, it's extremely hard to deliver on hype, especially for someone like Travis, who was already one of the biggest artists in hip hop after the commercial success of Birds. He was already dating a Kardashian. He had already made some of the best hip hop albums and mixtapes of the last five years, but somehow he didn't just deliver on the hype for Astroworld, he destroyed it. Astroworld sold six times what Birds in the Trap sold in its first week. It was the fifth largest streaming week ever at the time of its release. When it finally left the top of the Billboard charts, it came back two months later. It sold two million copies, double platinum, in like three and a half months. By the end of 2018, and to this day, over 260 weeks later, Astroworld has still never left the Billboard charts. Maybe arguably, maybe objectively, Astroworld is the biggest rap album of the last 10 years. It is one of the biggest rap albums ever. In my opinion, it's one of the best. It is the actual definition of a modern classic. When you open up the dictionary and you search up modern classic, the picture they show you is just of that inflatable golden Travis Scott head that was popping up all over America in the weeks before the album finally dropped after two years of explosive hype. And this era of Travis's career was almost unstoppable. Astro World just lasted so long. Most albums just don't last that long. But there was just so much effort putting into branding, packaging, promoting, and selling this album. It had to become an icon. But of course, none of that would have worked if it hadn't been as good as it was. In terms of sound, Astroworld isn't all that similar to Birds and Trap or even Rodeo. I would easily call Birds and Rodeo dark, menacing, distorted albums, even in some ways twisted and weird. But Astroworld is psychedelic, colorful, vibrant. It's an amusement park of music that takes the formula of Rodeo, and by that I mean a mix of fun songs with some experimental ideas, and it makes it feel so cinematic and engaging, and it combines that with a sound that's simultaneously innovative and catchy to a level that made it one of the most popular albums in the world for five years straight. Because stylistically, there's something for everybody on Astroworld. It's meant to be a massive spectacle from start to finish. It's meant to keep you engaged and make you not want to stop listening. Of course, it also had to be interesting to hardcore fans as well, which it was. But of course, listen, this isn't the meat riding Olympics. So there are a good amount of tracks on Astroworld that are just are not that great. Um, it's not a perfect album because I, I don't think the perfect album could possibly exist. That's not a real idea, but it's still a great experience that it stands apart from the rest of the genre and the time it was made in, in a lot of ways, because Travis
Travis Scott knows how to sequence an album to make it not boring and to make it engaging for a long time to come. Astro World starts with stargazing, which blends this beautiful psychedelic sound full of auto-tuned mumbling singing where Travis's voice is manipulated and chopped to feel more like an instrument than a rapper with trap drums keeping it grounded. In the middle of the song, the beat switch flips and the psychedelic rocket takes off into space with Travis fiendishly rapping over tighter, faster drums and deeper, darker synths and bass. Carousel features an homage to Texas hip hop from Big Tuck at the beginning of the song before Frank Ocean and Travis take turns weaving effortless verses together on top of a beat that I thought could have been a lot better, especially for someone like Frank Ocean. Days in it, taking no days in. Yeah. Don't need a vacation, I need a replacement. All right. What's in the lights out soon as we came in? Yeah. What are they talking about? What is pertaining? Yeah, yeah. But the next six or seven songs in a row are some of my favorites Travis ever made. Psycho Mode obviously ended up being an insane success to the point of mostly everybody being tired of hearing it forever. It was the first hip hop song to ever spend 30 weeks in the Billboard Top 10 singles. It was Travis's first ever number one single. It got multiple Grammy nominations and it has three distinct musical movements, four featured artists eight listed producers. It's a blockbuster song that was genuinely inescapably popular for years after it came out. Honestly though, Sicko Mode, it's not as good as the tracks that came after it on this album. It makes sense why it was the most popular song to come out of Astroworld or even honestly Travis's entire career so far. But even though Sicko Mode has three beats, none of them are really that interesting. Sun is down, freezing cold. That's how we already know when it's here. My dog will probably do it for Louis Bell. That's just all he know, he don't know nothing else. If I wanted to be silly and pretentious, I would use words like humid, dense, or chaotic to describe a song like this, but ultimately, I just don't like it. Sure, it's an exciting song with a lot of quotable lyrics, but it really sounds like a 2018 trap song. And there are other tracks on this album that have a much more interesting sound that dives a lot deeper than this one does. But even though I don't think Sicko Mode is really special or all that good, it ended up being a huge factor in Travis Scott becoming one of the most popular rappers alive. And I won't deny that at all. But personally though, there is one part of Sicko Mode I actually like. The music video is really interesting, it's very entertaining, and there are lots of creative visual cinematography techniques that I still look at to this day and think, how did they do that? So I 100% see why that video has over a billion views on YouTube. R.I.P. Screw is one of my favorite songs from Astroworld. It's heavily inspired by the late 90s, early 2000s Houston hip hop with a slow, laid back tempo and spacey production. The Mike Dean synths, Sway Lee's heavenly vocals, and Travis's very chill rap verse pay tribute again to the classic Houston style. Rest in peace to screw tonight, we take it slow. The end of that song transitions straight into Stop Trying to Be God, which is one of Travis's more relaxed, low-key songs, with him rapping melodically about humility and religion over a godly backdrop of Stevie Wonder's harmonica, Kid Cudi's humming, Mike Dean's church organs, and James Blake's mournful, layered, angelic singing, all at the same time. Ride for it every night Visions in these angles tight Truth be told, I never try this is definitely one of the more defining creative moments of Astroworld, and I look back on it all the time. While Travis's previous projects were defined by a late night feeling that made him almost the trap version of The Weeknd with booming Atlanta sounds instead of clean R&B, Astroworld is much more clear, colorful, and psychedelic, with introspection that isn't hidden under a layer of drugs. Skeletons somehow packs a ton of content into two and a half minutes. I just don't understand how this song has so much going on all at once. Pharrell Williams, The Weeknd, Travis all singing together in an ocean of formless reverb, Kanye writing the lyrics, Tame Impala producing the track, making it a full-on 100% verified real psychedelic rock hip-hop crossover. In my opinion, Skeletons is a masterpiece. The drum breakdowns, the grungy bass, the cymbals hitting like waves on a beach. We just rock Coachella, I gave a half of the check. It was good, sex out of a mention to the net. 
didn't pass the loud that was out of respect after words passed the time it has a beautiful progressive sound like nothing else i've heard wake up with the weekend is a really horny song that i actually usually skip i like the production it's based around this really bluesy feeling guitar riff and the minute long outro has a great guitar solo that strangely clips in the mix on top of swirling keys but i just don't like the lyrics on the song i think it's kind of weird you could call me catholic but it's just not for me i don't want to wake up i want you spread out on the sheets Sarah, this is so good uh, this is so but 5% Tint is a really similar song. It has a piano melody that feels almost the exact same as the guitar riff from Wake Up and the dirty Southern ambiance that I'm almost sure is a chopped up sample of a pig snorting calls back to Upper Echelon, one of Travis's first singles. It has a very similar atmosphere to that song in general. The 5% Tint motif is lifted from the Mike Jones, Slim Thug, and Paul Wall song, Still Tippin' from 2005. Who's that creeping through my window? Before you come outside, I got the info. Took it to the end zone from the end zone. No, I let her smoke, you let her lick mo. NC-17 is the least streamed song in Astroworld. It's kind of a low light for the whole project. It's just a pretty generic 2018 trap song, and it's not really as thoughtfully made or planned as the rest of the project. But Astro Thunder is, again, different. It's a lot like Skeletons. On this song, Travis Scott brought multiple highly accomplished producers to the studio to create a vibe unlike anything else he had worked on before. Even though it's only two minutes long and it's basically just a short interlude with one verse from Travis, the production from Frank Dukes, the synths from Vegan, the bass from Thundercat, the guitar from John Mayer, it gives the song a beautiful sound with lots of tiny details like analog feeling fuzz in the mix and dreamy melancholic melodies that float above the song like stars shimmering in the night sky. See like the life I feel See like the life I feel is a little distant yeah. Seems like the life I need Seems like the life I need is a little distant yeah the bass and the drums dance underneath and almost silent space lasers shoot across the mix while John Mayer's hypnotic guitar wistfully ends the song. In just one verse, Travis Scott tells this story about his lonely and isolated mindset that comes from his desire to be a better person. Despite the short length of the song, it says a lot and this is one of my favorite songs from Astroworld overall. Yosemite feels like Nav and Gunna got most of its runtime, which is kind of crazy to me looking back. It's kind of a shitty song, but this is another one of those tracks on Astroworld that's good. It continues the dreamy floating psychedelic aesthetic. And with that being said, Yosemite is one of the most streamed songs on Astroworld. It was a huge hit back in the day, even though it's not one of the most memorable anymore. And I personally don't prefer it for any reason at all. That's on my neck, dollars big hits, hop off a jet, belly get rest, catch to the more and I get a chance. You sell and run on my best and my chest, Chanel address, clean up a mess, I eat a flesh, you know the rest, kind of a hunt, couple of Can't Say is a very colorful, expressive song with some of Travis's best vocals, and it's also the track that introduced Don Tolliver to the world. He was a young rapper, also from Houston, whose melodic R&B singing has a very unique texture that meshes perfectly with Travis's auto-tuned vocals, creating this vast, expressive, colorful soundscape of harmonies and melodies and it's one of the most dreamy unique songs travis has ever made no you can't save i'm mad enough smoking hella weed i'm on the alcohol shot it lick me clean away she sucked me up i keep two o's in my bed i got them turning now all at the same time, he's still referencing in the production the Houston chopped and screwed style with pitched down vocals and slow, almost lethargic drums in the outro. Can't Say is one of my favorite trap songs ever. I absolutely love this track and I come back to it all the time. But of course, I can't talk about Astro World without mentioning Coffee Bean, the ending track that is another contender for possibly the best song Travis ever made. Ultimately, Astro World is just one of those albums. It takes all of the greatest ideas, trends, and motifs of its generation. It mixes them in with some experimental sounds, some very real songs. It mixes different genres with the psychedelic trap sound that's either very trap or very psychedelic, depending on the track. It has some really beautiful moments of both, and the end result is that Astro World feels diverse and creative enough to essentially be one of the best mainstream trap albums ever. It's an amusement park in musical form that does a million things all at once, 
balance with the right fusion between unexpected and expected to make Astroworld an icon of its generation. Musically, it really was and still is one of the best trap albums ever made. Maybe it's not the most experimental, maybe it's not the most raw and real, maybe it's lacking in lyricism, but almost every song on Astroworld brings something unique to the table. In a genre that was often full of filler or generic sounds, almost every other trap album sounds whack in comparison to the size and scale of this one. The reason why I like Astroworld so much is that Travis and his team made it so poppy while also making it interesting. They added all these little details and styles and sounds with the heavenly floating ambiance, the tributes to Houston rap, the psychedelic textures. Yeah, Travis only really put down a few actually great verses on here. Yes, there are definitely some more bland trap beats that sound dated nowadays like NC-17 and Who What, and there are definitely some underwhelming features and lyrics on Astroworld. So I don't want you guys to say I'm glazing, because for me, Astroworld isn't perfect, but it's still one of the defining moments in music that only comes around a few times every decade. It's a moment where something that's really good becomes really popular, and as a result, it stays in the cultural consciousness for a long time. Not just an album, but an icon. It's still early, but I almost want to say it could be put on the same list as Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, you know, Pink Floyd's albums, Ziggy Stardust, Radiohead, Nirvana. I'm not saying that Astroworld is as good as those albums because I don't think it is musically, but as time goes on, I think it's going to be just as iconic, visually, sonically, commercially. Is it a classic like those? Is it perfect like a lot of those albums I just listed? I don't think so. But is it going to be just as iconic as those albums? Honestly, I think it will be. I think this album is going to last for a very, very long time. I think it's going to be an icon of pop culture for many years. And honestly, it already has. It's been on the Billboard 200 for five years straight. There hasn't been a hip hop album that successful in the five years since it came out. For trap music, for this current era of hip hop, there probably won't be ever again. So in short, Astroworld has a great atmosphere, cool beats, and honestly, I still sit down and listen to it five years later. So what more could I possibly ask for in a world of music that's here today and gone tomorrow? So anyway, after Astroworld, Travis Scott was officially the biggest rapper in the world. He had the biggest album, he was throwing the most insane concerts, he had a kid with one of the most famous women in the world, so Astroworld was really the roller coaster that took him to the top of the industry. The only problem was what goes up must come down. But after Astro World, everything in Travis Scott's career was amazing for a long time. He wasted no time dropping more music after Astro World. Highest in the Room became his second number one single just a year later, with a beautiful music video showing a new futuristic sci fi change in his creative direction. Then just a few months after that, he went to number one again with The Scots by him and Kid Cudi. Then he went to number one again with the song Franchise at the end of 2020. Another highly successful project that Travis put together during this time was the Jack Boys mixtape, which featured one of my favorite Travis songs and visuals ever for Gotti with the late and great Pop Smoke. The Astroworld tour grossed $63 million, and Travis Scott merch and visuals became the fucking modern day Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon t shirt. Maybe I'm crazy, but I feel like you couldn't go outside without seeing Astroworld merch for years, and I still see it. I still see people walking around with Wish You Were Here Astroworld t shirts out in public. I mean, for fuck's sake, I was wearing one for like two years straight. Half of my fit pics from 2019 are just uh, me wearing an Astroworld Wish You Were Here t-shirt. I'm pretty sure the Astroworld Wish You Were Here t-shirt is the only piece of rapper merch I ever bought. And I wore that shit to death. Basically what I'm saying is the icons, the images of the Astroworld era became ubiquitous with music and pop culture itself. But I also want to mention another single he put out during this era, The Plan from the Tenet soundtrack. Never saw that movie, but this was amazing. Produced by Wonder Girl and Ludwig Göransson. I think you all definitely should hear this incredible beat if you haven't already. I didn't went back in my cell, felt like hell, fuck I risked it, pace yourself. I you living, know you thrilling, off a sin it. How I got my strikes and pendants back in now, then the street, what is why I let it be. 
But moving on, Travis Scott's insane rise in popularity didn't stop at just a few number one songs. It became so much more than that. This guy was legitimately becoming one of the biggest pop icons in the Western world. These were things that just don't happen to any old rapper, okay? Like, I want to emphasize, you know, most people who make albums are not getting put on cereal boxes in every grocery store in America. They don't give just anybody a McDonald's meal. But the Travis Scott Reese's Puff cereal boxes were getting snatched up by resellers to post on Grailed and StockX at huge markups like they were a t-shirt or a pair of shoes. The Travis Scott McDonald's meal was the first celebrity McDonald's meal since Michael Jordan in 1990 fucking two. I don't know for sure, but the articles online wrote that Travis Scott was paid $20 million for his McDonald's meal. That is literally once in a generation marketability and branding. They hadn't made a celebrity McDonald's meal since the year Travis Scott was born. Personally, I was not about to go buy a quarter pounder with cheese just because Travis Scott was on the box. I'm not trying to get cucked by McDonald's for some shitty ass food, but that shit caused a frenzy. The Travis Travis Scott McDonald's meal was so popular that hundreds of restaurants ran out of the ingredients that they needed to make quarter pounders with cheese. They literally ran out of food. How often does McDonald's run out of burgers and cheese? Of course, there were people who hated on Travis Scott. They called him a complete sellout, saying that his music career was a late stage capitalist nightmare and he was nothing but an empty voice to sell products through. But it was an undeniably massively successful marketing campaign for McDonald's and Travis Scott. And it only further pushed him to new pinnacles of fame. He was a household name. But on the other side of it, there were even some people who said that Travis Scott's daughter with Kylie Jenner, who was born a few months before Astro World dropped, was basically just a marketing campaign to keep him more and more in the public eye. But no matter what you think of all of this, Travis Scott was undeniably becoming a master of pop art, a once in a generation icon where everything he made was desirable just because his name was on it. One of the craziest things that happened during this era of Travis's career was the spiked seltzer cacti brand that sold out almost everywhere, even though most people said the actual drink itself was terrible. People just wanted to buy a drink that had Travis Scott on the can. And trust me, I've tried cacti, it tastes like shit. Travis Scott is ultimately one of only a small group of pop culture figures, artists, musicians, rappers, or not, that have done something like that in our lifetime, leveraging their art to become an icon of consumerism. And I'm sure that a lot of you think, you know, this era of Travis Scott kind of ruined his music, took away his raw image, took away his persona, and turned him into a sellout. The Travis Scott McDonald's meal was the first McDonald's celebrity meal in 30 years. The first one in Travis Scott's life. But ultimately, we'll never really know just how far Travis truly could have gone with his music, career, image, and brand, because in November of 2021, on the first day of Travis's Astroworld Festival, a sold-out festival with over 50,000 people attending, 10 people were killed in a crowd crush, a major tragedy that essentially stopped Travis's entire career in its tracks. The details of what exactly went wrong at Astroworld Festival 2021 are extremely complicated, but also tragic and disturbing. Ultimately though, at the end of everything, even after billions of dollars in lawsuits were filed against Travis Scott for his involvement in the event, no criminal charges were filed against anybody. The judge in the case said that a tragedy isn't always a crime. Kind of in the same way, after a long period of hatred toward Travis Scott, the general public consensus was reached that no one person was responsible for the disaster since the tragedy was caused by a widespread high-level lack of proper organization and planning, the security, the logistics, and most of it had nothing at all to do with Travis himself. But at the same time, perfectly understandably, Travis Scott's public reputation was basically destroyed by the Astro World Festival disaster. Again, understandably, it was an absolutely horrible look for him and everyone around him. And while it later came out that he didn't even know anyone was actually hurt during the show, and he didn't even find out that people had died until after he left the venue, the videos of him keeping the show going during the disaster were a terrible look, especially considering that he had a long history of encouraging people to fight or break things at shows, and it had already led to incidents like someone becoming permanently paralyzed after getting pushed from a balcony during a Travis show in 2017. And of course, I'm also going to mention the fact that he was arrested and fined multiple times for encouraging 
his concert goers to break down barriers and beat up security guards. Of course, Travis doesn't control what people do at his shows, but with some of his most famous lyrics being, it ain't a mosh pit if ain't no injuries, a lot of people were understandably confused. And of course, naturally, all of the companies and brands that Travis had been collaborating with and representing for the past few years, they dropped him immediately. The Travis Scott dance was taken out of Fortnite. All of Travis's upcoming performances were canceled. Travis Scott day in Houston was canceled. Nike canceled the announcement of his next shoe collaboration. Dior canceled an entire Cactus Jack menswear collection. All of the fast food stuff, cereal boxes, the hard seltzer brand, McDonald's, it was all done immediately. A TV documentary was made about Astroworld Festival and it was called Concert from Hell. Travis Scott was essentially legitimately canceled and it really didn't help that his apology video was one of the shittiest apology videos I've ever seen in my life. It wasn't clear if Travis Scott would ever perform live again. It wasn't clear if he would ever make music again. Looking back, it's obvious that, you know, celebrities are always forgiven, time goes on, people always forget, but Travis Scott really had to lay low for a long time. I I remember people talking about like, yeah, Utopia will come out at some point eventually, but when? It seemed like it could take years until he was actually accepted back into the public eye after having been shunned by every brand and event he was working with at the time. But ultimately, it wasn't years until Travis returned and relaunched his career. It was a lot more like six months. I would say his relaunch was pretty quiet, but his first live performance after the Astro World disaster was literally six months later at the 2022 Billboard Music Awards, and it wasn't all that long after until Travis was releasing music and featuring on other artists' songs again. But the only problem was a lot of people thought that what he was dropping was honestly pretty bad. First of all, a lot of people didn't love Escape Plan and Mafia. These were the two songs that dropped the night of the Astroworld disaster. Looking back, these were probably intended to start the Utopia rollout, but they were also pretty critically panned at the same time. To me, Escape Plan and Mafia just felt like pretty generic trap songs. I'm really glad that these didn't end up being part of a Travis project, even if the reason for that was pretty dark and terrible. But there were even more songs that a lot of Travis fans just didn't love. Down in Atlanta with Pharrell, that was kind of a song full of lost potential with a great beat that Travis didn't really capitalize on. A from Lil Uzi's Pink Tape. Some of the songs from Metro Boomin's Heroes and Villains. A lot of people didn't even like his verse on Donda. And even though he did come out with some great features too, like Fair Trade from Certified Lover Boy or Pussy and Millions from Her Loss. And I also loved his verse on SZA's SOS. I'll be honest, for the most part, I thought the quality of Travis's future music was looking pretty unclear. Some of the rapping he was putting out at this time was just not that good. There were a lot of generic flows, a lot of unmemorable lyrics, and at this point, it had been years since Astroworld. It had been years since he even started teasing Utopia back in 2020, and there was no real news on whether or not Utopia even still existed. Travis's momentum was disappearing very quickly after it had already been destroyed by the year of laying low after the Astroworld festival tragedy. But then, the Utopia briefcase appeared, and a new era began. Utopia had to be different. It couldn't be as big as Astroworld. Travis Scott just couldn't get away with making something as big or as commercial after the chaos and controversy that had defined the five years since Astroworld. Utopia, in many ways, was going to be forced to answer for all of that. After so much time without an album, after so much doubt about whether or not he could deliver in terms of quality, after so much controversy and hatred in the news, Utopia had to be for the fans. It had to be kind of the opposite of Astroworld. Not a giant psychedelic pop rap party, but something with deeper, darker, more experimental sounds that could prove to the world that Travis still had it in him creatively and commercially. But somehow, and I don't really know how, Travis Scott not only delivered on that expectation, but he also made Utopia one of the most instantly successful rap albums of the last five years overall. Utopia has some beautiful music, but also some pretty mid moments. But with 19 tracks, it was probably never going to be perfect. But overall, it is again this gigantic musical journey that finds Travis continuing to evolve, not just in his own way, but actually pushing the genre forward at the same time. It mixes experimental ideas within familiar formats, and that's pretty much exactly what Travis needed to make at this point. From the beauty and the introspection of my eyes, 1,000 on my feet, stacks put it on my seat, 10,000 on my eyes, 
Roly poly on my wrist. Gotta make a flight, big day, slamming no face down. To the dark lullaby sounds of I know. When I'm in the zone right now, tell me it must do. Mm, tell me you just how I feel right now. You say it's just the drugs, and I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. To the dreamy poetry on Parasail and the. I stand tall. I fall. I get up. I fall. I get up. Booming menace of lost forever. I've been lost. Lost on islands, driven in boat cars. Just bring your girl, feel like she both fires. Young black nigga worked at the oceans. So how we? For me, Utopia has some of the most interesting songs Travis has made in years. Telekinesis is heavenly and peaceful. I can see the future is looking like we love through the skies. I can't wait to live in glory and eternity. While thank God is personal and grand. I won't doubt it, I won't. He won't mislead all his followers. Praying on the process, mind and spirit. Feel like, like I'm floating in my prime time. And sonically, Utopia feels a lot like Kanye's Donda. In the same way that Donda was, it's a little hard to pin down a specific sonic theme here. There are a lot of different musical motifs, but for me, I can't identify one overarching genre. There's some trap, some psychedelic, some cinematic sounds, some gospel sounds, some indie, some Afro beats. A lot of it sounds like Yeezus. Some of it sounds like Life of Pablo. Even a bunch of the songs are literally lifted from Donda. God's Country, Telekinesis, Thank God. These were originally produced and written by and with Kanye. Kanye for Donda. But again, this isn't a meat-eating contest, and I'm gonna be the first person to admit that there are a lot of songs on Utopia I just didn't love. Mainly the more mainstream sounding songs like Meltdown. I think Drake's verse is pretty weird. I'm not sure why people like it so much. Circus Maximus, I think, has some more boring features from Sway Lee. It's pretty good, but I'm not sure it really sounds as cinematic and epic as it should. A walking attraction, a walking distraction. I'm naturally black and I'm naturally breathing. Like a wind set of statue, walk under my wood where it's packed in. At the top of the tavern. Love with Kid Cudi, just not for me. I, I really don't like Kid Cudi after Kid See Ghosts or even for a while before that. I get it, I get it, I get it, love. They love me, they love me, love me long time. I get it, I get it, I get it, love, they love me, they love me, love me long time. I get it, I get it, I get it, love, they love me, they love me, love me long time. K-pop with Bad Bunny in the weekend, it's just, it's okay. I understand it's meant to be a big commercial hit, but I don't think it sounds like one. So overall, I think the less commercial songs on Utopia feel a lot more thoughtful and real. Uh, but that being said, Utopia is still a very cohesive cinematic album experience, and it basically has no skips if you're playing it front to back. No, it doesn't have as much of a storyline as Rodeo, but it still feels like there are themes to it. A lot of it is based around the idea of acceptance and staying steady through life's troubles, which of course Travis Scott has had a lot of in the last few years. But ultimately, Utopia is just another top tier Travis Scott album by Travis Scott standards. Yeah, yeah, it got a lot of bad reviews from Pitchfork. A lot of people have these familiar criticisms that come up over and over, like Travis Scott doesn't write good lyrics, he copies other people's styles, he just curates producers and his albums aren't even really his. And maybe that's true from one perspective, but to me, Utopia really embodies what's good about Travis Scott albums and it shows off his true talent. Because honestly, I think his lack of deeper personal substance doesn't really matter all that much. A Travis Scott album is and has always been a blockbuster experience that brings new sounds and ideas to a massively mainstream audience. His projects are detailed, they're interesting, they're memorable in a way that makes them last much longer than any old average trap album. And look, I'm going to be the first person to admit he doesn't have the greatest lyrics. I appreciate great lyrics. Travis Scott does not have a lot of them, but he's energetic and hungry and his music over the years has come to represent quality. Utopia has a great sound that's conventional yet unique.
unique, and it's exactly what Travis Scott needed to make to make a comeback or even just stay in people's minds after so long. The rollout, the deep cuts, the trap bangers, the sound that's bright and dark at the same time, sometimes thoughtful, sometimes aggressive. It's exactly the spectacle that it needed to be. And Travis Scott being a curator just really isn't a valid criticism. If he's putting together albums that are interesting and long lasting like nothing else around, what exactly is the problem with him being a curator? My only actual criticism is that there should probably be less features. Honestly, I think Drake, 21 Savage, and Future could have been left off this album completely. I know they need to be on there for the sake of sales and streams, but I think this album would be a lot closer to perfect if those three artists just weren't on it. But either way, it's honestly crazy that Utopia can be this long and so consistent at the same time. It shows that a lot of care went into crafting the project. It's a very detailed album, and in a way, I think it's almost a little more consistent than Astroworld. The track list is just a little bit better, and to me, there are just a few less forgettable songs. But whether or not Utopia stays in our minds is something we'll find out later as time goes on, but for now, it seems like it more than lived up to the hype, and Travis once again created a standard-setting album experience that will only add to his legacy as one of the best trap artists of all time, and once again, a defining artist of the 2020s as well as the 2010s. So what is Travis Scott? Is he a person, a brand, an idea? To me, I think the biggest thing that stands out about him is creativity and always evolving into the next thing. Across so many projects, so many different mediums, Travis Scott always delivers something memorable, unique, and worth talking about. In a lot of ways, he surpassed being a rapper and became a cultural icon on his own level. I understand you can say it's glazing, you can say I'm biased, I'm a fan, whatever. But all good, classic, timeless music has to get its energy from somewhere. You know, Kendrick Lamar gets his energy from genius-level writing, storytelling, unique voices. Kanye got his energy from the grand vision, the inspirational themes in his lyrics. The Weeknd gets his energy from his perfect vocals. All of these people have made amazing modern classic albums, but are any of them the best at everything? I think the answer is no, because they do what they do best and they use their strengths to their advantage. So I don't I don't think it's necessarily fair to say that Travis Scott isn't deep so he can't make a classic because for Travis Scott his music is good because of the vibes he curates, the album experience, the cinematic music, the sequencing, the memorable projects that become cultural icons every time he drops. The way that each and every single one of his albums is a unique musical journey defined by fresh sounds and recognizable moments. His music drives forward, it doesn't linger, the sequencing, the quality control, the creativity, it's all top tier. No, he's not the best rap no, he's not the best lyricist, but no one is the best at everything. Travis Scott has jumped from the hungry, distorted, wild sound of Days Before Rodeo, to the gritty, cinematic sound of Rodeo, to the dark, drugged out sound of Birds, to the psychedelic odyssey of Astroworld, to the gripping, eclectic, imaginative utopia. Each and every one of his albums represents a unique era, not just in his music, but in pop culture as a whole. And when you put them together, they paint a picture of a successful mission. An artist who became a pop icon by playing to his strengths. Because Travis Scott started his journey as an underdog rapper from Houston, Texas. He was sleeping on couches, spending his last dollar to look for the next opportunity, playing tiny venues with even smaller audiences over 10 years ago, and he took it all the way to the biggest stages in the entire world. From his albums, to his merch, to his brand deals, creating some of the biggest commercial impacts of any artist alive, all without ever losing his commitment to quality. A lot of these artists have started to fall off. You know, all these discussions about how artists just aren't trying anymore. People like Drake, ASAP Rocky, Kanye, these are Travis Scott's peers, but a lot of them have just stopped being creative. But Travis Scott has done all of that without ever losing his commitment to quality. Every time he drops, it's a new era. It's a new experience. It's always surprising, always energetic, and it's always creative. But Travis Scott is still inventing new sounds and ideas. And he predicted it himself all the way back in 2015 at the beginning of Rodeo when he was just beginning to craft his sound. At the end of the album's intro, he said, We gon' rule the world, we gon' rule the world, we gon' rule the world. Says, let your ambition carry you. 
And with that idea truly coming full circle, with Travis Scott going on to create some of the best, if not the best, pop rap of the trap era, becoming a true pop culture icon with his brand going not just into music, but fashion, gaming, film, and food, there are just so many artists nowadays who come and go. People who see music as a business opportunity and don't have the vision to leave a mark for more than a few years. But Travis Scott has a different, much more inspiring and motivating story. Through all the ups and downs, fighting past his humble beginnings with the hunger to reach his goals and make an impact, no matter what you think of his music or his rapping or his persona, there's no arguing that he is the biggest trap artist of all time. And he's created a massively successful catalog of albums that appeal both to dedicated fans and the general public. And none of that would be possible without his vision and his ideas. The story of Travis Scott is a reminder that hard work, dedication, hunger, commitment, that's what propels you through anything in life. That's what makes your dreams come true. And pretty soon, with Travis going on tour for the first time in years, everyone who knows Travis Scott knows that his concerts are all about raging and getting wild and crazy. He's really one of the most chaotic performers around today. From getting arrested for yelling at his fans to break down barriers and rush the stage, to Lollapalooza 2015 where his set got cut short because he started giving the middle finger to the security guards and yelling, we want rage, we want rage. So part of the fun of a Travis Scott show has always been just how unhinged and out of control they can be. But Travis isn't the first artist who built a persona around crazy concerts where anything can happen. People like Gigi Allen, Hannah Trash, they're the original masters of the art of violent concerts and they've done all sorts of crazy things over the years, like crashing bulldozers into the stage, or even worse. That's why I think you'll really love Danger Music, my new video where I explore the dark side of live music, telling some truly insane stories about the most wild and violent music ever made, and it's only available on Nebula. Nebula is where you can find tons of exclusive Volksgeist videos, literally hours of content that isn't available anywhere else, because I created Nebula with other creators as a big group project to take control of our creativity. We specifically designed Nebula as a platform and a company Company to be a place where we can make our best content possible without having to worry about all the overarching factors that make YouTube videos over-edited, watered down, or just plain boring. I've struggled for years with YouTube just allowing record labels to take my revenue for videos to the point where I had to fundamentally make my videos worse so they wouldn't be taken down even though I wasn't breaking any rules whatsoever. And that's why Nebula is so important to me. Nebula is the place I can put my best work, like my two classes where I deep dive into my process for writing stories, making animations, filming, lighting, and Danger Music, my brand new original, talking about the violent history of live music. So if you're interested in supporting my mission to make the best musical documentaries on the entire internet, you can get Nebula for an extremely low price. If you buy a year's membership for just $30, you're only paying $2.50 a month, but you can also sign up monthly for $4 a month. So support my journey to make the best online documentaries and subscribe to the streaming service that I myself am building, and in return, you get my very best content in its purest form ever. So go to Nebula tv slash volksgeist or click the link on the screen or the description below to sign up now for just two dollars per month for a year or four dollars monthly i'm philip this is volksgeist and once again thank you so much for the support